Yes. Welcome to LA, John. Well, thanks everyone for coming down, and thanks for Jim for doing this. Cheers, Jim. So, uh, so Jim, we're going to like continue each other here in a sense, yeah. aren't we? But what, the starting point is what I'm interested in is uh, with the stray cats, you kind of parachuted into the middle of what the scene I write about in this book. You know, that it's about 80, 81 when the stuff starts to break through. So, a lot of those bounds have got chaps on them, like that, and all those bounds are almost, so almost contemporaries. Do you have any memories from your life? We can just film this one day. We've been playing in New York in 79. We came to London in 1980. We wanted everything to be accelerated. And we uh, we um, were playing once a month, back to Kansas City, CBGB's. We could only do it once a month there because the owners, the bookers, were concerned that your draw would be. Diluted with 20 people who went out to see the punk rock or rockabilly or anything. Uh, in, uh, in 1979, would be less if you did it more than once a month. Uh, but we were a real band. We played five nights a week, so we would find we had our own scene on Long Island and around uh, 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 New York City. But the two famous clubs you could only do once a month. Uh, we wanted the whole thing to accelerate, and we had been getting uh, Enemy, Melody Maker, Record Mirror, Sounds. Time Out, one well, of the English, the UK uh, rock and roll magazines. They, there was five of them every week that had to be filled with stuff. So we would get them a couple of months late, like a uh, like an import record shop would have them. And we said, this is happening over here. There's punk rockers and there's rockabillies and there's teddy boys. And we got to go there. So we went to London. It's the right, uh, June of 1980. I've been playing for about a year. So we were very good at it. We we were looking for anyone with any haircut, kind of. <laughs> that was really our motto. We we we, we didn't know the, the exact tribalism in England. We just thought anyone who didn't have any haircut, get dressed up in any way, is cool. So we wanted to be amongst all of them. So, so did you get like, both fame British people at that time? You know, the way it wasn't just any haircut, but each haircut was loaded with meaning. And there was all these different scenes going on. So the bigger balance of the scene. And did you have any interactions with those groups as well? Yeah, we um just the people that you just mentioned, we we did. We went to London in nineteen eighty, we kicked around, we didn't have anywhere to go, we had no gigs booked, we had no place to live, we had really nothing. So we said, Let's go to England, okay. So we had a suitcase filled with clothes that we all shared, a guitar and a bass. Which we got a seat for us. We were dragged with this kind of around London for a few months. Uh, and we finally, I mean, you would know this in London, there's the little Siri uh, uh, rock pubs, the, the Dingwalls, the Greyhound, the Golden Lion, the Thomas A. Beckett that was right out of Quadrophenia. They had a boxing ring in the, you know, some of these pubs had, had music as well. Uh, so, and that's where everybody went. That's where, so the Shrek Cats, we were a little bit. You know, around town and nobody knew if we were any good at it or what so we would tell everyone come and see us we finally got a couple of gigs they came down and they was susie sue uh, captain sensible glenn matlock uh dave Anian, a lot of one people who strummer joe came uh, did, there would be there was 10 people in the audience it was like this and like it would be those people because we had met them at parties or shooting our mouths off around uh, around london so for us we didn't really know that right there was like four genres we were just looking for we we kind of thought everybody was cool and uh we 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 had unknowingly tapped into a to a you know a I guess a style that was accepted by each of the genres. Mm. No one could really, if you were punk or mod or skinhead or teddy boy or God, you couldn't say that you didn't like Eddie Cochran or Chuck Berry or it was just everyone kind of agreed on that. And I mean, we were a little bit the yeah. spokespeople. You landed at a really right time because I mean your band was incredibly stylized and what and in the UK style means everything for a core of people. 
And it did seem to really fit, you know, on the, the crossover. But you were also buying your Ronnie clothes from Johnson's, weren't you? Oh, yeah. You know, where where, where Billy Duffy worked day, as yeah. well. So that was kind of, one was kind of proto things that was leading into what eventually we could become a, a segment of what we became off. Yeah, and we, we, we liked everything as far as, uh, I, I think we were 90% rock really, uh, but we, that, that, that other 10%, we were really open to it. So, and when we got to London, uh, they, they meaning the people on the scene, well, you can't wear baggy pants and blue suede shoes with a spiky belt. <laughs> like, well, why not? It's like, oh, we think it's all kind of cool. So we were like innocently unaware of the, the, the exact tribalism of it. And then me being the one of the three of us that like to go out, I would gravitate. Those were the happening nightclubs, kind of. There was um, uh, Camden Palace was fantastic, and uh, Club for Heroes. George, uh, boy George was the tour man. Uh, the Blitz Club. I, I was just gravitated to like whatever the cool joint to to, to really to be. Well, I can't believe this. We we're, were on television. We were you know we saw it on the radio. And, uh, so for me, that equated to like being able to go out and see the most people and do the most, you know, mm. most fun stuff. And uh, then it was really kind of kind of the goth kind of style that it would, you know, was the really in vogue in London. Yeah, there's a lot of crossovers and things going backwards and forwards. Well, it, wasn't, it wasn't like a massive giant wall between what you were doing and what people were called goth. There was, there's definitely, I always thought musically, sonically, you're not that far away from the second Adam and the Ants album. That, sure. That kind of big sound sure. and that kind of celebratory kind of feel to the yeah. music. Uh, yeah, positively, Adam was around. He he he's a cool guy. I I, I was like their band and like Tim. Uh, 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 I'm trying to think because of the music papers, they needed to um, to to fill the pages. Like it had to be a lot of stuff got covered. And then what was really good, I suppose, made it to the next, you know, level of it. You were in the NME for two months instead of one kind of thing. So, uh, and, uh, I think a lot of the people that crossed, well, that middle zone there, post-punk, 80, 81, before, before MTV really here would have been, uh, 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 saw the straight cats, but it was like a different thing. And it was kind of every, it was kind of cool to go outside of your tribe a little bit. Which we were really happy about, and also unaware because we weren't from there. We were from New York, where we were trying to find anybody cool in 1979. That was a uh, punk rock had kind of passed. Uh, maybe you know, maybe New Wave had been there, but Goth or uh, that really hadn't happened in a funny way. We were in the exact middle, so we were um, uh, like it was okay to like us because we didn't ever say we're Goths or we're Ted's or we're skinheads or we're mods. We we were just kind of trying to be around those. Uh, that, that we thought were cool, and Adam was one. Um, he he was us early on, and he put a straight cat's head, which was a tattoo that Brian Setzer might self got. Adam got it on. Uh, he got a sticker of it made and put it on his guitar. Mm -hmm. So that was like N N M E. Adam was the biggest thing, and he had a sticker of the straight cat's on his guitar. Mm -hmm. Those little things went so far. Strongly yeah. the same. He, uh, uh, when when we first got a couple of gigs, we needed to hustle up like a like a uh, some like equipment and a and some, like a rehearsal room and all that. Um, and, you know, London went to Nomis Studios. The, the guy who owned Nomis' name was Simon, so we spelled his name backwards. So that was the name. <laughs> um, uh, but um, so so we kind of stumbled across a guy that did equipment, and it was Joe Strummer's uh, uh, brother-in-law. So of course. Joe came to see what the hub of this band's talking all of, and his brother-in-law was the was the tech. So he sees the gig, and that's the part that's really we had been playing for a year, four sets a night, five nights a week in New York. So we were good at it. when someone says your whole life is on the next you know, two three days, you have half an hour a day. We were ready for it, mm -hmm. and so when the next time the the uh, music papers came out. They would speak to Joe. They would speak to Adam. They would speak to Sensible. They would speak to Damien. Like, what'd you do last week? Oh, we went to see this band from New York, and it was very important. Then, and then that got you know, the you know, buzz gets created, and that's what we really lived off of. I mean, it's, it's interesting to talk to you here because um, I mean, obviously, your your roots are into rockabilly and, and way back to the fifties rock and roll, which I wrote about in the book actually, because a lot of the roots the scene are in there. And we talked about Adam a minute ago, but Adam was actually in. Rock and roll band before Adam the Ants, yeah, so sense. and there's an interesting story you told me before, which which I'm really annoyed because didn't get in the book because I didn't realize this. When we talk about we're just down the road from the whiskey, 
and about Jim Morrison going to watch Gene Vincent. Then. I didn't realise that Jim Morrison had that kind of pop culture sort of backdrops. And well, that's a you guys are from LA if you're here. So you know, Lucy Global, of course, uh, which is when when the Stray Cats we came to England 1980. We're from New York. We went to England and we signed a record contract in England. So part of an English record contract is that it's it's called X America, not meaning that you used to be from America. It's except because it it was a big uh, commitment financially for a record company to agree to try to break the band in in, uh, in in the USA. So so we had a record contract that was in England uh, for like two years more or less, and we came here like the beginning of eighty two the first time, um, late eighty one earlier, and of course we gravitated to the Whiskey to Go Well, which is like a world famous joint, and um, so, so we went to the whiskey, which was happening. It was in a little bit of a lull at that point. Like it stayed open during punk rock and early goth days, but it was like barely hanging on. But the people who ran it owned the building, so they, they had a little bit of uh, inspiration. Uh, and so we meet the original owners of the place, and they're you know, very interested in what we do because it reminded them a bit of the the you know the glory days of the fifties and early sixties here in LA, which you guys are from LA, so I can say it. I came here in nineteen eighty two, and I just never left. I lived in Roxy, and I just never went home. So, um, uh, uh, so the people at the whiskey were very, um, very keen to tell us that Gene Vincent had played at the whiskey. Gene Vincent, one of the, uh, the uh, original American rock and rollers, who really had an influence on everyone. And he was the first guy to adopt that all leather vibe, all leather, that big medallion. And um, uh, so most people, including me at the time, thought that it was Jim Morrison because famously, a lot for like a lot of history, uh, the doors of Ground Zero for 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 the whiskey go over for Sunset Strip, but it had been going on for quite a while. There was jazz clubs all along here with the Viper Room. This was a place called the Melody Room that Charlie Parker played at, and uh, it was very you know, rich history. Ciro's was uh, was was there. Uh, my place was there from from um, from ninety nine to two thousand. 15, right next door to the whiskey, I'm sure went to Cat Club and it was there. And I can hear likes, likes a lot of music in LA. So we were getting the history of the whiskey go go from the people because we gravitated towards it. And they all told us that Gene Vincent played there and that Jim Morrison would go and see Gene Vincent. Mm -hmm. And then, well, wait a minute. And then you, you follow the, you know, the rapid succession of years. It was probably Jim Morrison with a 63, 64, then the Doors of the NL got their big break, I think, playing at the Whiskey, 65, right? So to me, it's like a, a lot of it traces back to the original American rock and roll, which I always try to make that connection. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of follow that through in the book. It's interesting to talk about the ground zero of goth, because I thought I'd found it with the Doors, because they're the first band to be described as gothic. Not goth, but gothic when they played their first gig in New York City in '67. I thought, well, there's a the point. That I'll start there. But of course, you have to do the '50s stuff. It's important with death rock as well, and uh, and Gene is mentioned in there. But that connection you told me there is really fascinating. So in a way, that spirit has been through lots of music for lots of decades. But it's really, I guess, me personally, I think it starts to really um, coalesce around the doors. You know, with Jim Morrison had that kind of, he had the look. Yeah, he was, he was poetic, he had that sort of uh, and the fascination with sex and death, and the Doors played a very dark music. It's a new kind of darkness to it, one that I think that was very influential. But from the interest of the back to Gene Vincent now, and I can see yeah. it, because with Gene Vincent, there's a tragedy in his voice as well, isn't there? Yeah, he, he had that real, um, it's like an Irish tenor voice, Gene Vincent, with, mixed with his accent, which was uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Mm. And he had like a soft kind of voice, but... There was a lot of pain in Gene Vincent's voice. I think he was you know, like a classic example of that. And I, if like Jim Morrison is ground zero, what's it saying for that? He definitely was a little bit um, influential on that, I think, because you and I know really you know, nothing starts in a vacuum. That there's always a little bit of a uh, you know history or something, and that's what we you and I like to go back and find to to find that. What are the other influences that you think that would make goth? Like, I always imagine every type of music and every genre is kind of a stew with what the ingredients are to it. So, like, some well, origins. I think, I think we'll come to that in a sec, but I'm just thinking, 
now we're in the 50s. Well, I mean, was there other people? I mean, Vince Taylor, I think, was a, a very small yeah. influence in there. But sure. Because he kind of took Gene Vincent, but he went another level, didn't he? And his level of performance, and it's and he also, because he's inspiration for Ziggy Stardust, and he, you know, David Bowie used to speak to him in, in Tottenham Court Road, didn't he? When he was just a washed up guy, and, and uh, Vince Taylor would talk about how he's from out of space, didn't he? And that became the Ziggy Stardust, part of the Ziggy Stardust prototype, which is actually important in this story as well. But was there anybody else in the 50s who had that kind of sort of darkness to it? I mean, there's, a, there's kind of those very dark balance as well, isn't there? And mixing into the pot. No. Um, there was a lot of, I can just talk about Elvis Presley again, it has you know, a certain thing about him that was uh, kind of influential to everybody, whether it was, they said they didn't like it or they wanted to like it, whatever, I think it was very influential on all styles that came afterwards. Uh, Gene, for sure, Eddie Cochran had a certain, uh, uh, you know, sound and look, and then the kind of tragic end, but left a perfect mm. time capsule. Of the sound, of the music, of the look. So Eddie Cochran wore the leathers as well, mm-hmm. and uh, he he was kind of the first uh, um, real guy that I knew that was accepted by like everyone. But we were into Eddie Cochran, and uh, that he was kind of involved in all of it too, I think, because he toured with Gene Vincent for a long time. And I think Buddy Holly has a certain tragic and a certain sadness to him as well. It was mm-hmm. more of a yearning kind of, but. But like also like a beautiful thing, something that ends early, that's a perfect picture. You never had to see Buddy Holly when he was old, or he would even done the 70s. And the same with Eddie Cochran. So I think that's a certain golf kind of, you know, frozen in time. Sex and death, yeah. basically. Yeah. You got two years of the sex, sexy bit, then you were dead. A perfect career apart from the person. Sort of like feeding into like the 60s as well, I mean, he's still there, painted by the Rolling Stones. And do you follow the path through there as well? Do you find that interesting? I mean, I wrote about that in the book, you know, and it's, it's in there. There's a there's a dark side to the 60s, isn't there? And, and a darkness in the music. Then the doors really separate that perfectly, but just before the doors, there's still hints at it, isn't there? So, like, from the doors, it would have been to the... Um I, mean, I think Bowie's in there, like you said, because he's kind of guys in, in like a beautiful ways fingerprints on everything, really. That came, that came since, since him. I think he was very good at taking you know, elements of, and then like when did it get cranked up, Goth, and when did it get cranked up and slowed down a little bit? When would that be the ground? I think when it gets cranked up is with Bowie. Actually, going back to Bowie, I think most of the bands involved in what I write about the book are the children of Ziggy Stardust in the sense people who were 14 years old, saw Starman on TV and it blew their minds, you know. And the David Bowie interviews as well, where he would talk about so many things. He wasn't just flogging a new record. He would talk about the Indian Stooges, who nobody ever heard of really in England. You know, those super cult bands. Or he talked about William Burroughs and suddenly just widened the palette to what pop culture was. I think that was really influential. And then the Berlin records he made with Iggy Pop. You know, when people actually found out who Iggy Pop was, that was another massive influence as well, you know. I don't was that was that something that people in America got from David Bowie because he said David was huge in America but slightly later on. So maybe your relationship to what David Bowie does is different from ours. You know, when in the seventies he was so influential culturally and <coughs> musically. Um yes, we had some of Bowie's records. I I, I you know, certainly I would say glammed up look on TV, but I kinda would hear that there was rock and roll in that. Suffragist City or some of that stuff. It's totally that's Eddie Cochran, that's, you know, that's from the 50s, and 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 I think that uh, maybe in that exact time, journalists or uh, in record labels, they weren't trying to go back to what was perceived to say their dad's music or their parents' music, but someone like Bowie and Fields were so tuned into it that they kind of went with that. But if you would ask David Bowie, I think if any journalist said, do you like Eddie Cochran and, uh, of course, Vince Taylor, uh, Gene Vincent, Buddy Hall, I think he would have said, of course, can't you hear it here, can't you hear it there? But um, I heard that. Certainly um, when uh, when Mick Ronson plays with Bowie, I mean, he, he, he was, you know, for sure a, a huge fan of Eddie Cochran. I think it was kind of like... The common thread <laughs> through all the eras. Yeah, I mean, Mick Ronson put the rock and roll into Bowie's kind of art from the studio. Mick, when Mick Ronson's so key, key architect to the sound, and so many other groups afterwards as well, and feeds into a lot of people I interviewed in my book as well. His, his name crops up endlessly, but not as much as Bowie's, which nearly every interview crops up in. I, I, I certainly know from the rock 
the, the days that would lead into you know the God days. But a few of my original friends, um, I do know they talk about McGrath as a big influence. Uh, Steve Jones, Glenn Matlock, Captain Sensible, Dave Bainey, uh, uh, Mick Jones. Yeah. They they are all cite Mick Ronson as being kind of the guy as a guitar player. Bowie might have even been too like too huge of a thing to shoot for in a funny way, right? Um, but Mick Ronson, they kind of related to he was a working class guy, I think from the north from Hull, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 I would always hear Mick Ronson as being a big uh, a big influence on all the guitar players who, who kind of I mean in, in the UK glam rock is you know, for people my age, we're the same age, actually. Uh, I was born in 61. So was I. I don't want to give your age away. <laughs> I don't care about my age. But, um, but Glam Gl Rock was a big thing when we were growing up for kids, you know. So we watched Top of the Pops, which you've been on several times. You know, it's the key music program in Britain. 18 million people used to watch it. And every, every week, there'd be one Glam Rock thing, which would be a game changer. And Things that slight inside of Glam Rock sparks local, you know, the most British band America ever produced, you know, and we, we yeah. actually thought they were from Britain for like 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if they ever actually watched the Sparks film at all. Oh, yeah, you, you watch it for two hours and you know less about them than when you start watching the film. Are they, are they married? Are they real? They're just such, such fantastically mystical characters, aren't they? They yeah. still make great records. Yeah. I saw some funny thing today with Sparks. Um, they 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 had it that says outtakes from the photo session. <laughs> and it was the same as the one that was very, very clever and very like the differences were so microscopic and they, they had another outtake, really, really small. But they were American guys from LA, I believe, that went to um, England and then came back yeah. here. They, they, they did the same as, same as you really. They were, yeah. right they were from here, I think they're from LA or, or yeah. they, they sort of they were sort of turned up in the UK but so tuned into our culture like you did as well that it didn't seem, Stray Cats, when you were, for a British person, didn't feel like an American band. Yeah. Because you were tuned into our aesthetic, and Sparks were the same. When their first hit in 74 was this town, and it, the next day, now it's a cliche, but in the playground at school, everyone's going, Did you see that band last night on top of the box? It was completely crazy. What, you know, that, it's a made up quote from John Lennon, but he, he said, He ran up Ringo Starr, which he didn't, this is made up, it's a great story. He said, Did you see that band last night? One of them like Adolf Hitler, one of them like Mark Bowling. Which <laughs> 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 was true, because basically that's what everyone at school said. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, that it's, it's really good to say that because the person I was going to mention next was Mark Bowling. Mm, because it's very key. Uh, yeah. There is where I think the British were more, were kind of more tuned into it in a funny way. Like Mark Bowling was giving you Eddie Cock when he was Chuck Berry positively um, uh, wrapped up in a glam kind of rapper and came back to LA. I think he played really long here quite a bit. And uh, um, I'm I'm not sure if the kids kids I think is still the same to, to this day. Always right. They want the messenger to look like them. A little. Right. So, so, so for Mark Boland to be giving you Chuck Berry, Buddy Holly, that kind of stuff, uh, wrapped up with how you look, that's how you get the message across. I think he was influenced by it, and you know, I know that we were, and like I know that certain, um, especially in the seventies, someone like the Rolling Stones at a dark side, the painted black, and doing Chuck Berry, doing Buddy Holly, doing. Uh, I think if they looked like Carl Perkins, it wouldn't have really had the same effect. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, even though they, they would love it, the Beatles say love Carl Perkins. I don't think they would, if, if they had looked like Carl Perkins, playing a Carl Perkins song, it wouldn't have had the same effect. Mm -hmm. I kind of think the kids want want their messengers to look like them a little bit. So that's well, wasn't Mark Bowen's look a little bit too much for America? He only had one hit here, didn't he? So there was a misfire there, which I've never really been able to understand. You know, it was Get It On was a hit here, wasn't it? Which, yeah. Some yeah. reason it's called banging on, bang a gong here, isn't it? But, uh, but that was his one top ten hit, wasn't it? So what happened there? Because I mean, glam rock for us going as kids, and this is what's interesting. We're talking to you the same age. Our relationship with glam rock was everything, you know. But here is something that's intermittent. It's like a couple of Bowie songs and a Mark Bowie song. So for you growing up, what was glam rock to you? Well, um, it was a little bit before me. Like in '72, I was eleven, I think. Right. So um, we saw. When we never got into American bands, then I don't think we had Top of the Pops. It wouldn't have been like later on we would get videos of old stuff, but after it kind of happened already. So I think we would have been on solid gold, American bands, and those few things. But we definitely saw Mark Ball and think that's 
That's rock and roll. That's uh, Chuck Berry. That's uh, that's it's kind of original American rock and rollers, but like with a with a twist. Mm. And that's what we we, we love it. But it's a bit more distant than for you. Work. For it's mainstream in England. I mean, Mark Bowler in England is huge. You know, he's like for for a certain period of time, that's the biggest thing in Britain for two years, and then he faded a bit. Even though he's still making great records, but here's just one hit now again. One hit, and then he's very culty, isn't it? So Brian Mark, I mean, when I talk it in the book, to bring it back to the book and that, is key, you know, and, and goth is dark glam, and all those people were so influenced by glam, but they didn't do the, the sort of tinsely version, it was all in black clothes with a darker, sort of under, like something darker lying inside it. But actually, there's a lot of dark inside glam as well, even though it's quite tinsely, isn't it? And the kids liked glam, right? I think it's a further, that's what we're kind of heading towards, that it's kind of a further extension, but the look, they... The kids want the messenger to look like them. Mm. So the people who have been playing music, they would have been listening to Mark Bowler. Mark Bowler was listening to Eddie Cochran. I think you're getting all of it in the same kind of thread. Mm. The look changes, and which which I think is good. Because I think the kids have to have, or younger people getting into it have to, they have to relate to the messenger. So and when they get the message across, I think it's you know, the look is important. So what was your relation like, say, with the cramps? You know, the cramps are a very key part of my book, and they did a pretty long chapter. But it's a really mad story. You know, they, they met at this psychedelic college. You know, they're like the hippies, weren't they? In Lux and Tira, the big orange beard and long ginger hair. And they were taking loads of acid and doing a course on the magic mushroom gods. It's like, and then in a way, even though you're both, you know, both influenced by rockabilly, the cramps to me have always been a psychedelic band, whereas you're... Well, you were kind of rockabilly amped up for the um, for, for that period, you know, late seventies, early eighties, and it sounded modern, even though it was taking sort of past roots. Whereas the Cramps did something that was very LSD version of it, which is, is quite an odd thing. They were listening, probably listening to the same obscure backwards rockabilly records that you'd be listening to, sure. but where they took it was somewhere different. But would you see them as um, sort of fellow travellers or something quite different? I mean, what was the relation with them? Um, we. Saw the cramps it would have been 78, 79. Again, the phone's a little bit off of it. Um, uh, and we would go see them. They would do two two shows usually in the New York area. They would do one on Long Island where we grew up at a place called My Father's Place, and there would be 10 people there, maybe. And they would do the whole act, the whole thing. And we thought they were super cool. Um, we didn't know them then. Uh, and then we would go see them at, you know, Max's Kansas City, maybe, and they'd be, you know, the full floor, of the, you know, like as full as Max's could be. Um, it was a little bit more hipster, what what they were doing. But they did the whole show all the time, and we did a little bit of homework and knew that they went to Sun, Sun Studios and recorded, uh, and they loved the American Rock and Roll, original American Rock and Roll, and then maybe they, I, I think they were influential past their time, right? They were maybe ahead of the time and they got more influential maybe when they stopped touring a little bit. Or, uh, I don't know if they had a hit record that broke through so much. And I think in England they might have been more popular. Than, than there was, they were a very big cult band, you know, they, they played quite big venues without having hit records, but I think they're always on not very good record labels, they didn't really favour them. And they're also, they didn't comply to any record labels. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> there was a steeliness to them. Yeah, but I would see them later. I I think they came to see us, and like a little bit of a nice thing though. But with, with for for me personally, is that a few of the um, the artists that we loved, you know, a couple of years later they became friends with you know, peers, and that that's you know a beautiful thing to me. The the, the people from the Dam and the Sex Pistols and the Clash, who a few years before we were like trying to get into their gig maybe in New York, or then a couple of years later they were. You know, became peers to us, and and the cramps we knew before then, because they they did a few obscure songs. Like you said, they they kind of knew more than us in a lot of ways because we didn't really have that much ac access to records. Records were you know, ten bucks each on an import, and, uh, and like a funny way, a lot of the Gene Vincent records and the Holly records they were on on import because it had gone out of print in the states a few of those records. So we would find them in a uh, you know, a couple of different stores in New York that would be on import. So, straight cats, we based our whole thing on like 
hours. We didn't really have my dream is his greatest hits, Eddie Cochran's greatest hits. But yeah, so we didn't really know a lot of the obscure stuff. Like we knew it was rockabilly that that um, that we heard the cramps do. And then later in life here in LA, I, I don't know if anyone knows, uh, used to be a club called the Garage that was over in Soda Lake. And they tried to do like once a month they, they would get all the original American rockabilly artists, like obscure uh, people that did one track on Sun Records that Hayden Thompson, I remember going to see, Wanda before, Wanda Jackson before, it shared like the complete renaissance, and there'd be seven people in the gig, kind of thing, and the Lux and I would be there every time. Yeah. They really loved that stuff, and they would bring their records to have signed. They were together in their own way, you know, they were very uh, uh, collectory, a very nice couple together. But their roots were certainly in the rockabilly music, and like we're saying with Goth, the whole thing is what you do with the information that you have, right? How do you spin it again to make it, you know, make it your own and make it of your time? Right? The big, yeah, they, the they did a very studious deep dive into that music. They would go on car trips and buy up loads of really obscure seven inch records. There probably only a hundred of those records. I mean, some of the stuff they covered was stuff that nobody ever heard before, to the point where people actually thought they'd written those songs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, if like anyone knew what it's hit my radio show, if anyone had a copy of Dwight pulling sunglasses after dark on the you know you know the Paramount label and I owe you a coke, you know, <laughs> but they were those people, and they were you know, and uh, uh, we admired someone like them who had taken this you know, music to another extreme and put like their own spin on it. But we were also the kids from the school band, and you know, straight cats. We 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 all took lessons and. Practice, and we were the guys that we wrote, wrote and could write music. But the other two, right? You know, they could cite, hear something, and write it out. They're not virtuoso types. But we loved rockabilly music. It was the thing that spoke to us. We liked the energy of punk rock and the, uh, um, you know, the image of it. And we also were guys that studied jazz in school and all that. So rockabilly for us was the was was that combination of the two things, like the energy of something and the look of something, the kind of DIY angle of it, but we were the guys that took lessons and practiced at the same time. So um, so Rockabilly, when we heard that, it was like, wow, and there's this look to it. You can combine the look to it. And it, it you know, it was just a beautiful thing that we, you know, the, as soon as I heard that, I knew that's what we what we had to do. So let's talk about your friendship with Dave Aynan, because Dave Aynan, obviously the down doing the book, um, mm -hmm. He's a, he's like he's very pro talk off. He had the lockdown from about 1974 onwards, actually, before even punk. And there's a good quote in the book about he said when he joined the down, he had to dress down a bit. <laughs> he's walking around like a vampire, you know. And he's a great gig, a perfect job, isn't it? So we, so you say like he'd come down to your gigs, and did you have like sort of in-depth musical conversations with him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave was a shy guy back then. I got to know more within the last ten years, say, than I did back then. Um, uh, he's Certainly a rockability at heart, you know. I, 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 I think he's kind of an important guy because he, uh, again, he combined influences. I think he was into like, uh, you know, like original um, uh, Hollywood kind of glamour, and also into you know, like a Victorian kind of really, you know, uh, Victorian theater, but. Definitely was into Eddie Cochran and rock and roll, and then how it came out was what you know he did. But he really invented his character. I think he was one of those guys. And what I always say about these people that we talk about so you know, <laughs> casually is they're all really good at it. Like Dave Bainey, at the end of the day, is a really good singer and can really write a song. It's not just the guy that put on some makeup and got some old clothes. And yeah, that, that, all the people that we're talking about that are in your book are really good at it. They're in your book for a reason, because they heard it. And also 24-7. I mean, I you know, Dave, Dave Aiden will go home for a tracksuit on. It's, it's always going to be Dave Aiden, isn't it? <laughs> Even his flats was Dave Aiden. Was, you know, nowadays people have their flats for all that kind of stuff. You can buy anywhere, can't you? You know, like sort of gothic, sort of candelabras or furniture or whatever. But he was doing that in about 1977, 78, when... God knows where he even got the stuff from, you know. So <laughs> was that something when you came out to the UK and you thought, Jesus, the people are really into this stuff, they, they do it all the time. It wasn't switch on, switch off. Yeah. That's that's really what we loved and related, because we were doing 
and it's similar thing getting dressed up like English teddy boys and adding our our spice to it. But Home Island, 1978, 79, where it really was you know, a safe haven. Half the reason why we went to London was that we hear that you get left alone by looking, you know, however you want. If the Stray Cats hadn't, you know, could had a success, I probably would have stayed in London and worked at Johnson's or something. Just like to be around like-minded, you know, we're not British, but we like to get look a certain way all the time. It's just how you feel comfortable. And uh, to me, London, and then when I got there, nightclubs, and it was the era that goth was starting to put, like everyone, you could have a regular job and dress and look how you wanted to. So, so that was an important thing to me that Something like Top of the Pops or Mark Bowl and into Goth it really was kind of an important thing for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure what time is. Okay, so I think we're done with this bit. So, is there any questions from the floor? This is a bit everyone hates and it goes, everyone starts looking down at the floor. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, question. Yeah. I'll start with it. Um, where would you place Scott Walker in that timeline or would you? I know Scott Walker. They were they were American guys who went to England. I I I, I do know if we we'll make the next Johnny Ramone was a huge Walker Brothers fan. I I think he was ahead of the curve too. He was one of the I I think he was Laurel Canyon and then went to England. And uh, I I I think their records are very much like that. They're very they're very lush and very uh, you know kind of gothy in a funny way. Like, the, there's a, a tragedy and a drama and a theatricality to their music, which is key to all the bands in the book as well. Um, He's mentioned in the book, and he's an influence on a few people in there. But well, I mean, obviously, he's not cough, but there's there's a there's an interesting embrace of the darkness and the dark romanticism. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is kind of in there. That's but, what but even the records he made right, right at the end of his career, when he made that record solo, which is a mad record, and it's just like <laughs> all this amazing kind of drone, drone noise, and him nice singing on top of it, which is to be experimental that age is something because most people get stuck in their little grooves, don't they? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's in there without being a key component to the whole thing. But like Jim was saying before, there's, there's, there's a lot of different little influences. You know, like me, Nico's in there, yeah. on the ground sure. and all that yeah, stuff. So. Right. Now, is uh, 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 someone like Red Orbison is a bit cocky in his own way? You know? like, yeah. yeah. I'll that one that's, I mean, I would say, I would argue Roy Orbison's records have probably got more tragedy. And his life is tragic, but the tragedy totally. in his voice, which yeah. is one of the greatest things ever. Really. Totally. Yeah. I, I, you know, I could see that there's other people that I hadn't thought about just now. It's like a firecracker, you know, pack of firecrackers in my head. And <laughs> they start going up. And Scott Walker's a good one, I think. That's mm. you know, led me to think of Roy, like lush, mm. you know, ballady, but kind of dark, dark mm. songs. Yeah. Okay, well, I think you. We just really uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. It's just more of, more of a comment. Uh, I think your book is so so uh, uh, um, informative. I mean, I just read the the you know the initial offering on on Amazon, which is you know gives you a little preview. And I mean, I've been in the music scene for for uh, ever, <laughs> and there were bands there that I was like, wow, I don't know this band, and and I went, you know, I'm about to research and enjoy the product. So I, I thank you. And, and that's just that's my comment. It's a really good comment because what, as a music fan myself, when I write a book, really, I want people to listen to everything I write down in the book. Because exactly. I think, you know, as a music, you're a music fan, I'm a music fan. And the greatest picture of a music fan is to turn people onto something. So as you're going through the book, listen to it. I wish it wasn't Spotify, but unfortunately it is because no one's going to get paid very much. But, you know, if there's every single band I write about in the book, please listen to them. I will. And then, you know, if you've got, if you've got money, if you've got a proper job or not, just to buy their records. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's so, what I do. That's what I do. <laughs> Depeche Mode in your book? Hey? Depeche Mode are they in the book? Yeah, they're in there. Yeah, More they're, they're kind of goth for Jason, I would say. But they were definitely embraced by a lot of people who got yeah, they're, 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 they're all about mine. And like, they love rockabilly music as well. They did part of their movie. They went to, uh, I think they went to Sun, right? They did, uh, they, uh, Memphis for sure. And they did, uh, so, uh, so you wouldn't think of them immediately as being... God, uh, as a you know, rockabilly or rock and roll, but they are, you know, God, we always call it Gothic like, Jason, so it's yeah. kind of in there, but not in there. But it's but their, their records are super embraced by people to see, you know, they, you know, and I think it's because they start off being very pop. When I saw them on the first tour, when they had all the little white outfits on, it's so different from when you went next, but no, they were great then, though, weren't they? Yeah. I, I, I love the pop to oh, yeah. really yeah. And also, there is a little bit of darkness in there, even their early records.
which you know but then they, they obviously listen to a lot of people in that, what I write about in the book and it influences them but you know what I really love about them they're always really honest about their influences you know? mm-hmm. so people always go it's brilliant how you did that we go well it wasn't us we took that from Meister's and the Neubahn we took that from Nick Cave whatever but they made their own thing out of it and I think that mm-hmm. the humbleness of them is something that I really like you know yeah. But they also, but he's, they're, they're, in the end, they made the most tragic records, dark records. All right, Pete, my old buddy Steve Strange is he in the? Uh, he's mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a uh, he was one of the guys that had these mic uh, nightclubs that were as important yeah. as anything. He was yeah. kind of on the on the doorstep of goth, right, Steve? When he did, uh, it's kind of, but some people in the, in the book don't see what he was. The know. gathering spot, I think, is always very important. I oh, like to talk about the clubs. You know, oh, like, clubs, clubs out if space, there's yeah. you know, 10 people, 12 people who are independently living a certain way, you might not see them walking down the street. and not see where you work or where you go. But when there was a club for like-minded you know, people, uh, that's what I like. I would join any of them. I thought it was cool to go out to that club. Could be cool. like, you know, Could Steve be cool. was one of the yeah. guys I remember that like created that, a space. Yeah, yeah, but became a lot of goth, you know, types and look. Clothes shops as well. That's yeah. another key thing as well. You know, I mean, even if you take one step back, you know, to uh, where when you talk about Johnson's, that was kind of space, but also um, sex as well. You know, sure. Mark I, I even put like Jordan in the book. I mean, Jordan wasn't sure. Uh, wasn't a goth, but. Uh, fierce individualism in from seventy four onwards when it didn't even exist in England. I think it was definitely put something into the DNA of people. You know, just just know looking at her, you know, think, yeah. "Wow, that's amazing." Yeah. So, uh, yeah. what about the joy division and the cure? I mean, how do you guys? I like the way you're talking about the living edge and the branches going on, but it sort of seemed like they existed on their own, and then all of you guys. Yeah, we saw what. Joy Division aren't a goth band per se, but there's a chapter on them in the book because you can't, I mean, musically and sonically and how dark they were, it's a changed way people thought about how you made music, you know, Ian Curtis's vision and his voice, so important. Of course, he's coming, he's basically Bowie and Jim Morrison mixed together, but a very Northern England version of it. And I think maybe musically they were, they were taking some cues from Bowie's Berlin records, but in a very Mancunian kind of way, it's, it's a different way of doing it. And we can't not talk about Martin Hannett, the producer, who made his production of those records still sounds like 40 years in the future. You know, it's totally genius. You know, you can't even work out the sh- how he made those records sound so shivery and futuristic. So really important. The Cure's journey is actually quite interesting, isn't it? Because initially they were like uh, more like a pop band, but in a good way, like a lo-fi. So it's it, in our heads when we heard them on John Peel and we saw in the early days, they seemed to be somewhere between Wire and XTC. And then they, they obviously did her joint edition, they took start going dark. And by the time they got to pornography, they made one of the most important records in the whole scene. It's an amazing record. It's one of the most intense, darkest trips of a record ever. And I thought, wow, what's the next record going to be like? And it- I kind of love the cross pollination of the whole thing. But the, I saw Robert and they don't want to be called the guy. I said, well, why not? That's what I, if you have to describe something, you're DJ on the radio. Okay, there's a goth band coming up. Uh, you, I like being able to. I don't see it as pigeonholing something. I think of it more as identifying something for me. Yeah. And, and but if they don't want to be that, that's fine. But I can still say what they are. <laughs> and they're one of the best bands I've ever oh, seen. They're probably they get way way up there. The best yeah. one I've ever seen. We just saw them not that long ago. They did their Hollywood Bowl run here, and they're awesome. Mm. Sing and play so good, and there's just song after song after song that hit song that you know somehow. And you know, the audience was dressed up, you can see like a cross section of the audience, but Garth was totally in there. What's, what I love about America is the eternal optimism and people embrace stuff. Well, what you've got to say about England is we're just a bunch of awkward twats, you know. So, so no, no punk band was ever a punk band, and no goth band was ever a goth band. But around the rest of the world, people see it completely different. So your explanation of it is completely perfect. But it's not, of course, in England we'd all be squirming, going, no, no, we're not, we're just miserable, we don't like anything. <laughs> Which is what's brilliant about the radio. That's really good. That's awesome. We have time for one more question. One more question. Uh, That's a question for Jim, uh, since you mentioned the whiskey. But first, I have to say, I saw the Runaways play three nights in June 1978 at the Whiskey. The opening band was a little band from New York playing their first ever LA shows, The Cramps. Oh, fantastic. But anyway, the, reason, the question I have for you is you mentioned the Whiskey, and I was kind of thinking, like, okay, I wonder if he's going to mention about t- playing shows there because, of course, he played the Roxy instead. Yeah, the first time we came to LA to play the Roxy, and we came as part of, like, would have been put in with a lot of the English goth 
fans because because our record was on import, like we said before, even though we were American and Maybe we're the most American band, but we're uh, the, that's why the format we were just talking about to call something something, especially for the radio. So, so we were being played on import here in K Rock, import alley. We uh, used to play the straight cast before the record was available. So, when we played the Roxy, was where a lot of those British goth bands would play. So, we were that's what, where we were getting played on the radio alongside of those bands. Mm-hmm. So, when it came time to play, that's the gig that we put aside. So what, yeah. it, it was it was more that rather than the fact that you like you mentioned the whiskey was kind of like having a little lull. Uh, this uh, it was eighty one, and that's where they they meeting whoever was kind of helping us a little bit to play at the Roxy. When I I had never been to L A before, and I do know that during the time that we were here, we started doing one show, and that turned into two, into three, uh, and I think we had to do three or four shows and matinee shows as well. So it was for kids that could come in the daytime. It, it was. Really cool, and I think one of the nights we might have had offer before. Right, right after get Tom Petty was playing a run at the, the Whiskey. He did a week or whatever. Maybe it was even the same time. Maybe that's why we did the Rock and Roll the Whiskey. But um, some somehow I think at that exact year the Whiskey was still kind of like classic rock in a funny way, and the and the Roxy was maybe more indie. The design. Now I've been to each of them five thousand times each night. I love it. I'm. I live around here for a reason. Queen Drive, and I, I'm just. This is my neighborhood around here, so I. I I'm all for this one. It's true. I, I, I just wondered because the first Cure show was at the Whiskey in like June, June, June July '81. I think it was. I guess it's really a bit like the ancient whoever they had a relationship <laughs> with in a funny way, you know. Yeah, but yeah, it's not always a cultural decision. Sometimes it's just a showbiz decision or a business right, decision, right. isn't it? Yeah. So you guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. 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 Thanks.